Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How are you this morning? Come on, jump. Where's your energy? <laughs> We're going to drink some gin very shortly. Wow. I know it's 10.30, and thank you for being here on time. I know there was big parties going on last night throughout uh, this wonderful city. And uh, I had an early night because I had an early start, but I'm going to make up for it after this. But I will be joining you in a couple of lovely, lovely old school gin drinks and Geneva, I should say, very, very shortly. Uh, my name is Wayne Collins. I'm over here from uh, London, and I head up uh, the Mix It team, which is uh, these wonderful people here, and also in the middle, one of our colleagues uh, is one from uh, Bowles, Geneva. First to my left here is the delightful Amanda Humphrey, who's Hi. our Mix It manager and trainer for in the UK. Next to her is uh, John Clay, who's the UK ambassador for Bowles Geneva and Bowles Liqueurs and other brands like Galliano. And at the end there is Mr. David Miles, a long-standing colleague of mine who also runs up and heads up the Mixit program with myself and Amanda. Um, a little bit of background, myself, I've been in the industry for 25 years now as a bartender, more of a traveling bartender today. What Mixit is basically a, a training education program, it's award-winning. And we cover a lot of things of, you know, categories, brands, and mixability, and the history of various drinks and things. So hopefully you'll find uh, this session quite in, in enlightening and hopefully inspiring. Because as what it says there, it's a London tale of gin and sin. Um, from Gin Palace to Cocktail Chalice. Being a Londoner myself, previously before becoming a bartender, I was a Costa monger. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's a street tra trader. So I used to work on fruit and vegetable markets since I was about 12 years old. So I know a lot about the history of Gin Palace and London drinking establishments and the kind of social aspects of society and what went on over the years. So we're going to share that with you today. Uh, we're going to bring some new bits of material hopefully today which is going to be hopefully uh, enlightening for, for yourselves and, uh, and we're very excited to share some of the, the stuff here. I'm presuming you're fans of gin anyway. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Geneva too. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. So you're starting to see that resurgence in interest in Gin Palace, but what we're going to share with you today is what was a Gin Palace? What were they like? What was the designs? Um, what we have now in London, which are, like, you know, resemble them in somewhat way, because the reality is there is no more Gin Palaces of the original ones, but many uh, bars which were opened up um, in the latter part of the 19th century based their designs on the Gin Palaces. And we've got some beautiful images to show you of, of the styles and what they are, why, what makes a gin palace and what they're about. And it's a, gin's a real rags to riches story, you know. It, it covers all uh, different aspects of social history in London and it intertwines with various other parts and elements of uh, history itself. And it's a real checkered story. So you have to bear with us because this has been a real patchwork and there's so much information in, in, in this and it could go on further and further. Personally, I think this is a TV documentary waiting to happen. You know, but in an hour and a half, I'm going to give you as much information as possible, and I, and I hope you'll be uh, uh, enjoy it and share and share that the love and uh, passion we have as well for something that's uh, wonderful. Uh, Mr. I just want to say, um, unfortunately, the clicker only works on that side, so I'm going to be keep pointing out to that gentleman on the end Next there. Next slide, please. <laughs> we are we are going to be talking about um, an age of gin palace where there was uh, lots of debauchery, lots of theatre gaiety, and lots of drinking, lots of uh, prostitution and stuff, so uh, we've got to be quite explicit because we're going to be talking about old London phrases, which is commonly used still today, and also share with you sometimes some names of streets which were quite, you've got to be <laughs> kidding me, they actually had a place called that, yeah, <laughs> right and uh, it's still there, it's just changed its name slightly as time moves on, so Mr. Miles, ah, now, this gentleman, I'm not a big fan of him personally because I've got a you know, come from a big Irish background in London. Uh, but uh, I'd like to open up this one with uh, John Clay from uh, Bowl Geneva because if it wasn't for this gentleman taking to the throne in 1688, we wouldn't have had gin in London. And then this is where the journey begins. And it's a great, wonderful story of when this gentleman came in straight after the fire of London, changed a lot of London, what it was going on. You know, it's a great, interesting part of where we are today with a wonderful product like a uh, category like gin. So. Over to you, John. Uh, thanks, man. Um, so this kind of feels like, I guess, the road well traveled for me. I spend my my day to day talking about this all the time. So um, it's uh, it's a story that that I really love. Um, I work uh, representing Geneva, and Geneva is a, a relatively small category. No matter where you are in the world, it's, I, mean, I, I understand it's the same in the states as it is in the UK. And Geneva is a a pretty small thing that. 
people are sort of gaining interest in as the as the world of gin gets bigger and bigger and bigger, people get more and more interested in Geneva and, and what it is and where it's from. Um, and part of my sort of day-to-day -day thing is fighting against everything that the gin people say, because uh, gin marketeers are very good. And, and I, I used to work for, uh, for Plymouth Gin. Um, I've worked in gin uh, pretty much all my bartending career. And um, there's a necessary thing, which is to take on the history of Geneva when you talk about gin. So if someone comes and does a, a, a seminar or a training session on gin, normally they just hook into all the stuff that's relevant to Geneva as well. So the, the story of it gets quite muddied and uh, it almost becomes like Geneva and gin are, are exactly the same thing and they're, they're synonymous. But um, the truth uh, is, is well, couldn't be more different. It's, uh, they stay completely separate um, right up until you know, even now. Uh, there's not one point where one just gets replaced by the other. Um, so to give a bit of context to this story, uh, I'm pretty sure if you've, if, well, seeing the hands go up of who's interested in gin, you've probably heard this story uh, like a whole bunch of times before. So I'm not going to tell you the, the whole story over again, but just try and give you some context as to why that story is important. Um, when William of Orange came to the throne of England, I mean, the guy's a Dutchman coming to the throne of England. Um, English, I don't know if you know, are quite patriotic still now, but back then it was even worse. Um, and the English and Dutch had been fighting for a good 150 years over uh, colonial territory in North America, the Spice Islands, Southeast Asia, tea and coffee in India. Like, they didn't get on. William of Orange coming to the throne was no natural fit. Um, and even on top of that, <laughs> Wayne saying why I didn't like him, um, from a religious perspective as well. Um, so it wasn't natural that he would come to the throne. So whilst there were supporters of his, they were, I mean, exclusively with the nobility, um, with people with money uh, who were going to benefit from him being on the throne. Um, the, ma the majority of people had very little reason to like him. So when he did things like banning imports of spirits, banning French brandy, uh, putting high taxes on, on German wines and other stuff that was popular, um, it wouldn't seem like it was a smart move at first to, to start doing that. Um, but in encouraging the production of domestic spirits, so taking the fact that England has uh, a huge amount of grain, it was in, uh, happened by coincidence that when he came to the throne there was uh, a good climate, so bumper crops of, of grain in England. Um, he encouraged the production of both beer and spirits and removed all of the licensing that you needed to be able to produce a spirit. So um, he really gave a boost to, to that economy and to that agriculture. Um, sure, there were people who were drinking Geneva in sort of salutation to the king, you know, having, having a toast to the king and raising that, but the majority um, were probably not really bothered by, by who the new king was. You know, they're not re it didn't really affect them that much, apart from what was relevant to their day-to-day -day living. You know, could they, could they get drink? Did they have a house to live? What were their, their living conditions? Um, Geneva, at that time, was still a multi-spirit with botanicals in, stored, for the large part, in barrels, in wooden barrels. So it was no different to a juniper spice bourbon. If any of you have ever tried the, the Balls Barrel Age, you'll know that Geneva back then is a, is a completely different animal to gin. It works nothing like it, tastes nothing like it, um, bears almost no resemblance to what, to what gin is now. Um, so we always say that when, uh, when Geneva uh, came to England that everybody wanted to drink Geneva in like a toast to the king and that's how suddenly it became gin. Uh, but it didn't just replace like that. In fact, the, even the, the, the moving of the word Geneva, which was from a fr French term, Genève, um, going into gin, that's not as clear cut as it might seem. There was this new like, uh, uh, class of people that were in between the nobility who had all the cash and had all the land and the working class. But it's the people in the middle who were starting to emerge from this uh, new economically successful environment in England um, 
who had a bit of cash were interested in arts and culture. It was the new bourgeoisie, the, the middle class, the people who were interested in the fashions of Paris and what was going on and wanted to, wanted to be cool. I guess kind of like the, almost the original hipster, you know, but with a bit of money. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> these uh, uh, people were, obs uh, like I say, obsessed with stuff that was coming, spe specifically from France. Um, so words that were coming in in the early 1700s were being adopted straight from the French and funnily enough they're a lot to do with catering and, and I guess the hospitality industry like cafe, restaurant, menu, picnic, like these words that are uh, still in use today and they were kept in their original form. They didn't adjust them for the English. Often you'll hear that the word uh, gin is because it came from Geneva or Genève, which in French was too complicated for people to say. But it's not the case because people were using French words left, right, and center. The, the abbreviation to gin is because gin was a signifier for, uh, it was a slang for fast living, loose morals, uh, uh, being fairly cheap, a, a quick fix. Gin as a word uh, doesn't just reflect the movement of a multi-grain spirit with juniper coming in and being adopted into England. The stuff that was being made in England is famously awful. Um, and gin was, had, had, been, had been reduced to this thing that um, was uh, looked down upon, that was sneered at. You know, the famous image of Gin Lane, um, which I'm sure we've got on the slide or we'll talk about. Um, Geneva had come in as this spirit that reflected the riches of the spice industry and the East India trading companies and was drunk by nobility. You know, right through till 1809, Geneva was expensive. Geneva or Holland's gin. Geneva was uh, being sold for like 20, uh, 23 uh, shillings for a dozen, which is equivalent of about 70 quid or what's that, $140? Is it double? Mm, close enough. Close enough? OK. <laughs> so $140 for uh, 12. So that's like 10 pounds still in, 18, in 1809, which is the same as French brandy and uh, Jamaican rum. So it was, it was still you know, pretty highly regarded. So it came in as this rich thing. But through its anglicization, or its, its turning into being an English product, spat out as this like cheap, crappy, awful spirit. So it was really at rock bottom, and I guess the story of this presentation is then to find out how did that kind of come back up? How did, how did things change, and how, and how did it get better? And it took, it took quite a lot to do that. Um, the Gin Axe? Yeah, they come soon, well, shortly after, but uh, just to touch on that, it's actually, what well, it's correct, 1714, it was first mentioned in English literature as intoxicating gin. And that's the only evidence of it turning from being, prior to that, being Hollands or Geneva. But it, it started in Geneva. I, I kind of think it may have been Londoners. They should, they, they, they come, often shorten things down. You know, to say gin, it was easier to say than Geneva. And me being London, I know they always cut words in half, or they use rhyming slang to, say, to mean something else. And you think about many words over time get anglicized. We look at uh, Ishkivaha, you know, from whiskey and Ishki into whiskey. And then you look at Sakram Fishnarum into rum. So somewhere online, the English always had this habit of shortening uh, products down. And there's some lovely libations are coming out, which is great. Uh, John, do you want me to go on to that next slide? You know, yeah, you, yeah you I think so. I've got this one here. So in the early 1700s, where we move on to now is this uh, gentleman, Daniel Defoe, who's obviously very uh, famous for writing Robinson Crusoe. But he also worked, he was working with the big uh, Whigs establishments in Parliament as well. And what he was kind of uh, responsible for was he put a pamphlet together in support of the worship, worshipful company of distillers who kind of held a monopoly in London of all distillation of spirits made from grain. They, they encouraged farmers to make more lower grade grains that they could distill quickly and produce obviously um, a more of an abundance of gin. At first he supported it, then he went against it and he uh, basically started off, what was his term was the gin craze. He said no, you know, London's going to be going mental soon drinking all this gin because it's very cheap, the poor are drinking it, it's easy to produce, it's in abundance, it's outselling beer, 
you know, at one point, you know, it caused such more outrage. And the picture below is, a, is an image from a, you know, a classic kind of gin shop. And I want to make uh, this point here because people talk about dram shops, gin shops, and gin palace. They're very different. A gin shop was basically someone's home. And in a parlor, they would have people come round. They'd make cheap crude alcohol with flavored with turpentine, sulfuric acid, and various things, and flavor it up. And gentlemen would come round as well to see the ladies of the night. You know, and there was uh, different pseudonyms used as well for the, for the gin itself, like Ladies Delight, uh, Royal Bob, Cockholds. You know, very, very strange name for like, trying to hi hide what, what gin actually was. So this caused a lot of mal moral outrage, and that is where you start to see what they call the gin craze. Then a series, uh, a series of gin acts started from uh, 1729 up to uh, 1751. Basically what it's done, they were kind of contradicting each act to one to another. They kept changing it through Parliament. And they were obviously trying to control the level of drunkenness and consumption of gin in, you know, gin shops and all around London, in these kind of slums, if you like. These are like ghettos you find in modern day, uh, anywhere in any big city in the world. So gin acts, you know, started to kind of control production and get more licensing. That gave rise to, you know, beer producers to get beer and and, and that was seen as more of a healthier option than gin because it was, uh, you know, replacing water almost. And when we go into slides with William Hogarth, you'll see the, the whole thing about, you know, Beer Street and Gin Lane and what they depicted. Uh, but the Gin Acts, uh, what they actually done for that 30 years was they sent London on a massive booze bender of 30 years of total drunkenness and debauchery. <laughs> and in that you had, you know, people of very you know, were held in high regard from different classes and lower classes mixing together in places like uh, gin shops and they were drinking and they were getting drunk and they were having a lot of sex, you know. And they weren't uh, too quite shy about it either. I mean, they were paying for death rates increased, there was more crime, there was more theft going on in London, you know. And so what you have with these gin acts is they, were, they didn't really know where they wanted to go and what they should be to put a control on this uh, overconsumption of, uh, of gin throughout London. And the gin itself, as, as uh, John touched on, wasn't of a high quality. Farmers were producing a low grade grain as well, so they can mash it up, get it distilled by the worship company of distillers in London, get it out there, sell it cheaply, and of course, it was gonna be a drink of the poor. Some people were still moving to brandy, they were still getting brandy, the rich still drank brandy, but the, the poor, unfortunately, you know, they drank um, gin. And gin was, that, in them days, gin was the opium. For the, for the four people of London in, in that day, pretty much. Even babies had it in their milk, was fed to them to, you know, put to sleep. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a sad, it's strange one punch. for me. <laughs> and it was a milk punch, yeah. John, you want to add something on Gin Act? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, because um, we were talking about this earlier, um, that we always call it the Gin Act, and whenever you read a history of gin, it'll always call it the Gin Act. But it never was the Gin Act. It was the Sale of Spirits Act. So every single amendment to that, not once, was it written in legislation that it was the Gin Act? It was sale of spirits. Um, so it's just telling that there are other spirits. People were drinking other stuff. It's not all um, that people were drinking gin. But the fact that they chose gin uh, as the thing to refer to it is just, again, this thing that gin was representative of the cheap, the fast living, the let's get shit faced at any opportunity kind of mentality that was, that was rife uh, throughout the 18th century. I've got a little uh, phrase here from an early, early publication of an article written in London about gin shops as leading to increased promiscuity and prostitution. The association between gin and prostitution came about because gin shops were public places and brought prostitutes and customers together. These same gin drinking women were held responsible for the increase in spread of syphilis, with the male responsible in the spread of venereal diseases was widely ignored. Women were singled out and vilified for this. The strange thing here is prostitution, we know, quite an old profession, as some would say. Um, the gentleman of his time as well is, you know, yeah, that's what you're going to do. We like today, you know, yeah, there's condoms around. Back in them days, they, they used to use sausage casing, pretty much. Honestly, straight from, you know, pig's belly. So, you know, having, having a sausage casing, which obviously wasn't working, I think, John, you said you've read something about that you had one from, what was it again? Oh, yeah, if uh, it was a sausage casing or something, if you were, like, of a lower class, but... Um, if you were of a higher class, you'd have one made from cotton. It's made from, like, pressed <laughs> linen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, obviously it's permeable. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it has, a, like, a, a loose piece of silk on the bottom, and then you tie that around the base and you tie a bow. <laughs> it's all very pretty in them. 
it's, a, it's actually thought as well that with this, the, the poor, the sausage case, actually took them home and washed them and hung them out to dry with the rest of the laundry, <laughs> which is quite scary. I mean, when you think about sausage casing and where that comes from and think about the women and the way they were, why would you want to make love to a pig twice? <laughs> I can't work it out. <laughs> anyway, there's a little line here of uh, a word Cheryl used from the same writing. Um, this wicked gin of all defence bereft and guilty found of whoredom, murder, theft. Whoredom. I never heard that word before. Gentleman on the end is a real wordsmith and he said, is that a real word? It's a re well, now I'm looking into it, it just sounds like it's a really posh word for a hooker. In some way, in about way. A new one, new one. Now I think that's right it. Yep, you <laughs> got it there. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Now, this obviously we love uh, this image because it depicts so much uh, social depravity of what was going on in London at the time. William Hogarth. Basically, what you have is um, these two images, which are very, very famous. You know, he was commissioned to do these by Parliament one time to show that, that, that what was going on in social aspects of London at the time. And on, on, the, on the left hand side, you've got Beer Street. Beer Street depicts wealth, you know, well fed people, um, painters, new buildings going up, prosperity is there. Well, Gin Lane, you've got literally now, you know, Madame Geneve there in, in the middle. You know, she is, is dropping her baby, if you can see, dropping her baby over the staircase there. Uh, you know, I mean, the crazy, the, the crazy thing is that she was, she was labelled to be part, part witch and part whore. At works talk, yeah, lovely. Yeah, so what you have with um, Madame Geneva in the middle, you can see she's got late, the Asians on her, on her legs, um, bruising out from all the probably drinks she's consuming. If you see just above the bridge there, you can see a young boy who's gnawing on a bone while his um, impatient little dog watches by as well. So these poor kids are poor. Then you've got the, then you've got the porn brokers who are you know, trading in anything that you can give to get them to get themselves a few pennies to buy some uh, gin. Because you know, that old saying is, you know, um, Drunk, drunk for a penny, dead drunk for two, straw for nothing. Because these gin shops where they would get gin and drink, they get debauched and get out of control, you know, they would just get drunk, fall asleep in straw at the back of the gin shop, probably roll about in their own vomit, wake up and start again. I mean, it was the crack cocaine problem of that generation. It was a massive thing. You think of drug craze today, the gin craze was quite scary. You know, apart from social deprivation, you know, you had this moral, out, moral outcry. And if you look at the picture there, you've got a coffin hanging from a man's house, is falling down, the pawnbroker's making money from anyone who, could, who wants to get a next fix of gin. On the right is a distiller. What's really interesting about in the two backgrounds, you'll see two churches. On Beer Lane, you'll have St. Giles's, which is just in uh, Covent Garden. And on the right, you'll have St. George's of uh, Bloomsbury, which is further down uh, into Holborn. And uh, these two churches still stand today. This picture was done in 1731. They actually only finished constructing both those churches in 1730. So it's interesting that at that time, the church were being built and there was all these kind of different kinds of behavior going on. And uh, we see that in, in so many ways now that maybe not a lot's changed today, I'd say, I guess, in some ways. I mean, yes, these people were off their heads on gin. You know, we've all been there, right? At some point or another, I might go and do that tonight somewhere while I'm down here in New Orleans enjoying myself. I mean, gin, gin, gin Lane is like Bourbon Street. <laughs> There's not much difference there. I mean, if you see some of them uh, ladies of the night as well, standing outside some of the shops, you're, I'm going, yeah, Madame Geneva's still around somewhere. The inspiration is carrying on. And yes, we've all had that kind of off your, off your head. You know, you remember the time you might be going home after a very heavy night and that, that picture of yourself and you've got your head under your arm. You know, you know you're, you're telling people, as you see my head, me and my friend are trying to look for him. I know what that feels like. So you completely kind of debauchery was uh, continuing through those days. Next one, sir. Don't, sorry, David. Next one, please, sir. And that's why this one is for Mr. John Clay here. This is a new slide, actually, we put in yesterday, pretty much, uh, because he found it. We found it quite a fascinating uh, take on the, that kind of journey of uh, gin and Geneva. Yeah, it just kind of... It, it it, it leads quite nicely on from what we've been saying, is, or what I've been trying to put forward, which is that um, Geneva was still very much respected. Jim was, Jim was rock bottom. Um, actually, on that previous slide, you know that phrase you were just saying, the dead drunk for a penny, yeah. uh, the dead drunk for a, yeah, for a pound or whatever. Um, it's on the bottom of that, uh, it's on that slide, on the Gin Lane etching, isn't it? Uh, yes. Sir. Yeah, on the, can you go back one second? You can't see You it. see where the, um, where the lady's dropping her baby, there's the bell and then there's a, a, like an archway, a doorway. That uh, saying is, is written, it's the inscription above the doorway. Yeah. 
So it's the idea of, of gin being in the basement of being like dark and devilish and, and awful. Um, but Geneva was still so fairly highly regarded. If we go back to, to, the, to the next one. Um, this guy, Henry Morland, was, um, uh, was uh, a painter uh, who lived in Covent Garden who ha had a fair amount of money. He wasn't exactly the richest man in the world, but he left a, a pretty sizable estate. I think it was about 120,000 he left when he died. Um, and in the, in the last year of his life, he, um, he was so ruined by... Uh, his career in London as a painter and uh, uh, drinking so much to uh, kind of live out the last of his day. He basically knew he was going to die and decided to move to Brighton by the seaside um, to, to spend the last year of his life. And while he was there, he wrote this list uh, one day of um, his daily routine of what he drank. And Holland's appears there quite a lot. It's the first thing you have before breakfast. Um, rum and milk, coffee, <laughs> I think a token coffee. Uh, Holland's porter, so uh, port, like a, you know, the same as what we have now. Um, a shrub made from rum, rum and lemon, ale, Holland's and water, so diluting it down a bit. Port wine with ginger, so a bit more flavor. Um, bottle porter, port wine, porter, <laughs> just uh, I, the same thing over and over. Um, and then it's not until he's had opium <laughs> that he then decides to have gin. <laughs> So that really tells you something about what gin was. You know, you know when it's like 3 a.m. and you're on one of these bars in Alibi or on Bourbon Street or whatever, and you have a shot before you go home? For me, seeing gin on that list, that's what gin is. Gin is like that, oh, let's have some nasty tequila. You know, like when, it, when, it's, uh, when, you've, when you're at the very end. Um, so I put this, uh, I wanted to put this slide in just because it really shows that before we go on the rise back up, for gin to become something that actually symbolizes the gentry and, and English at its most hoity-toity. <laughs> um, this yeah. is the kind of end of it. This is where it's... What's nice on this slide as well, what I like, is you see the list of drinks. He's got there port wine. That's a good connection for what we're going to be going to, talking about where, where early cocktails were made, and ginger. So that's a nice little link in there of that time to, we'll, to move along. I, I want to add to this as well, there's a gentleman called Francis Place who wrote in 1745 about uh, gin shops at the time. He said, the enjoyments of the poor this time were limited. They often had only two things, sexual intercourse and drinking, and that drunkenness is far by the most desired, as it was cheaper and its effects were more enduring. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, by 1750, over a quarter of all residents in St. Giles's, which was where Beer Street is, interestingly enough, uh, and in the parish of St. Giles's, just around from Common Garden, there were gin shops, most of them also operators of receivers of stolen goods and coordinated spots for prostitution. And the next slide will probably bring in nicely to these two buildings. As I said, uh, so the one, the one on the left is um, St. Giles's. Uh, and some of the lanes which are, you know, the thing is, believe it or not, a lot of people ask me, where's Gin Lane? Where was Gin Lane? It wasn't, it didn't exist. It was Hogarth's depiction of a street or what was going on in this area of London. And uh, right here in St. Giles's Parish, you know, you've got St. Giles's High Street, which leads to Holborn. Now, these, these, are, these are the two churches which are in the actual Beer, Beer Street and Gin Lane. And the one on the right is the one that's in Gin Lane, which is St. George's, which is further up um, in Bloomsbury. But what you have here is you're moving into an area there of that part of London. I don't know how many people are familiar with London, but there's a very famous part of London called Seven Dials. And that was a reconstructed, you know, in an early part of the 19th century. They rebuilt after the different gin acts and they're trying to get rid of the slums and the de degradation which is going on within this area of this, this part of town. And, you know, it came more refined that, but it was still the gin shops here. And this is where we start moving shortly to why gin palaces came about and what they were. Because, you know, London's such an old city. It's, you know, it was the, 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 at one time the biggest and greatest, wealthiest city in the world. It's still very big. It's, uh, I think it's the greatest city, but it's also, it is also actually still the wealthiest city in the world, without a doubt. And the thing about London is, you know, 2,000 years old, and there have been so many things happen from when the Romans discovered it, that we have taverns from Tavernay. They were different styles. We had alehouses. You know, we have uh, coach inns. They're all very different. And before we get to classic Victorian pubs, right in the middle, lost a little bit, is a gin palace. And if it wasn't for the gin palace, we wouldn't have the boozers that we have today in London. 
So we have very different kind of different drinking establishments, different kind of habits, and that will go on in these. Next one, sir, thank you. So this is Seven Dials. This is a picture from it from, I believe this picture is just after this wonderful pub, The Crown, which is still there, as you can see on the right hand, on the right -hand picture. This picture goes back to about 1840s. And on the right here is a gin palace called The Grapes. If you see the picture now, you can still see the green tiling on the outside, the ceramic tiling, which is a fine example of what the style was moving towards gin palace. Uh, the pub still stands at a crown. It's a nice old pub, and it is a public house. It's not, it was more of a, you know, based on more of a tavern, and very beautiful inside as well. They still have the, the, the clock still there, but they don't have the, the, the uh, dome on the top no more, and some of the windows of that has changed. But it's still there. The streets lead off the seven streets around Seven Dials, and it's a very, very fashionable part then. It's a very fashionable part of London now. And uh, interesting enough, that lovely building, which is a small, which was once, it's called, it still says the, the grapes are still on the side of the wall, uh, in Thailand, it was called the Grapes. It was a, an old gym palace, and now it sells uh, sexy gentlemen's underpants. <laughs> so again, why it's, it's maybe not, not moving too far away from what it originally was at one time. <laughs> now this is a bit of um, a, a big reveal for me. I'm quite excited about this. For our industry, in the drinks industry, I've wanted to know for years. Being a Londoner, born and raised, and I used to drink in a place called the Gym Palace, which is now part Gym Palace Apartments up in North London. I remember going there when I was about 20 years old when I started working in an uncle's pub and I got taken to this place and I saw it and went, oh, this is really beautiful in here. Look at the, look at the, look at the work, look at the, the way it looks. It's very Victorian. And it was called a Gym Palace, but I had no idea at that time, and this is 25 years ago, what a Gym Palace was. But, you know, it was a very popular pub. Unfortunately, now it's changed into an apartment. It's called Gym Palace and uh, the famous uh, artist, Damien Hurst, has um, a studio in there as well. But it was part of the, built and part of the Metropolitan Meat Market. But uh, the first gym palace was built in 1830 by um, this gentleman, John Bonaparte Papworth, and Stephen Geary. The gym palace was called Thompson and Fear, and they were very, very um, faint. I should move away from that a bit, shouldn't I? I'll go on to this one over here. They were very, very famous uh, wine merchants of the day, very, very wealthy. So what you have when you design this one, um, so all the time looking for what was a gym palace, what was Thompson and Fear and gym palace. It's been wrote about in many, many books, many publications, many trade magazines. Everyone mentions 1830, first gym palace in London, Thompson and Fear. And they were wine merchants. What they were doing was they were trying to bring, I guess, from the, the poor of London at the time, from the slums they were living in, they were trying to bring a baby sense of grandeur and bring them from the streets and get rid of the gin shops. But it's all to do with the, the license because the beer trade was growing and uh, the, the distillers, distillers were losing out. So they thought a way to come back is to build this lovely, opulent, you know, very ornate, beautiful kind of establishment called Gin Palace. And you, what you got here is the original drawing for the Royal Institute of British Architects. I got in touch with them and said, I'm looking for an image of Gin Palace, Thompson and Fear, and blah. they sent me these two shots. And uh, I'm quite confident right now, these actually never, in, in our industry, they've never been seen before. So just, this is a first for you guys and a nice reveal. So what you have is the original John Papworth drawing and above it, you, you, you can't see clearly, but it says Thompson and Fear and it's got the date, the address. You can see the cellar building. And on the right is what you have was the final design of what was going to be a gym palace. And when we see some of the modern picture of gym palace in a moment and their design, you'll see how they reflect that kind of character. A big change around was happening this time in 1830 of architecture in London. You were moving from Georgian style architecture into Victorian. What you'll notice as well, John Papworth, although he's got a nice, uh, lovely uh, hairstyle there, when you went from the 1700s, we also went from wigs to wearing hats, you know? And gentleman on the end there, David Miles, likes to do both today as well, <laughs> when he gets half a chance. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I was uh, very excited, actually, myself, you know, to, to share this picture with you, because I know different trade publications have asked me to share it with them, and they want to put it out there, because they said, we've never seen a, the original Jim Palace design, from an architectural point of view of what it looked like. We know what some of the interiors are like. We have examples left today, which we'll go on to. But um, that's a, a, a great find and a great piece uh, to, to discover. Now, Stephen Geary, this is another interesting picture for me. It's just coincidental. Stephen Geary was an architect who was responsible for what they called the Magnificent Seven Cemeteries around London, one of them being Highgate Cemetery, probably the most famous cemetery in London. He built the uh, old kind of style catacombs in Egyptian halls and stuff of that cemetery, which are very grand and very beautiful. They say he think he was responsible for working with uh, um, 
John Bonaparte, we've designed uh, the Gym Palace, but maybe more of the interior. And what you've got here on the right-hand side is you've got the original King's Cross. So anyone who's been to London, King's Cross is a, a major you know, train station within central London, which leads to all parts of London. But it was done for King George the, the, the Fourth, David, is that right, at the time? Yeah. Yeah. And he was King of England at the time, and then they built this uh, wonderful monument, which actually was uh, the first police station, one of the first police stations in London. But if you look at the design of it, it shows to me that, that grandeur of like using Roman columns, big lamps, all that stuff, was all what, what Jim Palaces became. And if you look at the picture next door, which I don't know where that picture comes from, but it's been quite visible in many, many, many books and many uh, uh, publications about this kind of image of the gin chugger. If you look at the design of that gin chugger, it looks coincidentally very similar to the bottom part of the King's Cross. So maybe one of them have a bit of a poke at Stephen Geary, because if you look at that picture of the gin chugger, you've got the lamps, You've got a lovely design, the clock. On top of it, you've got a, a pot still. Underneath, you've got the big barrels full of gin or Geneva, and it's rolling down a hill and killing everyone. <laughs> and, uh, if you look at, and if you look at the King's Cross, that's where the police to guard, to, to guard some parts of central London moving into the city. And, of course, if you went near them, and I think they probably killed you too. So I think coincidental is a, a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, picture. Hey, some... Uh, Here of, uh, again? Yes. Images of Jim Palace life. Um, I think uh, John's got something to add here about George Cruikshank was for very, very famous for right, you know, doing a lot of these uh, sketches of Jim Palace life. The Cruikshank where the gin shop has got there, you can see these big barrels which are up on the, the behind the bar. And you've got Old Tom, Cream in the Valley. I think it's out and out in there if I can see it properly. This is a start of Jim Palace design. When we go on to look at what gym palaces look like, you'll notice that everyone has got certain things. There's like a horseshoe island bar. There's usually a big clock behind it. In each of these etchings, you'll see a gentleman standing behind the barmaid, who's wearing, dressed up very nicely, serving gin and different various drinks from the tap. And these different images were pretty much what Cruikshank uh, was about. And John, you told me something the other day about Cruikshank, which I never really knew, because he was a, a temperance guy, by the way, as well. No, he, was, he was a really outspoken temperance guy. However, at 46, he drank himself into a coma. <laughs> and the year before, was famously in a bar with, some, with one of his friends, and his friend, for a dare, ate a wine glass. <laughs> so, not so temperate. <laughs> now, these, um, these, these gym palaces and these images with George Cruikshank um, uh, drew, and Dave's going to touch on in a minute about um, th th Charles Dickens. Obviously, many of his sketches are in Charles Dickens' uh, novels and writings as well. These are all based around the part of London, we're saying near Seven Dials and the two ch churches, which was known as the Rookery. And it's a real slum. You know, it was a sewage. It was a cesspit. Um, you know, but terrible water. That was, that, that, that was, it was just a rotten part of London. I mean, to put it in short, it was a real shithole, you know. And... Uh, what I like about this is right above it, they built a building called Centre Point, which is right in the centre of London, which is right almost on a part of where, you know, Jim Lane, Beer Street, and the, the, the images that Hogarth gave to us of this kind of slum in London where there was just social degradation going on. It was just depravity. It was a disgusting place. And um, I have to say that this lovely, lovely lady, Amanda, used to work literally on top of that slum in this modern day. <laughs> slum dog millionaire. <laughs> There was a street just behind there, actually. It's called Grape Street today. Um, it's changed its name a couple of times over the last couple of hundred years. Um, before that, it was called Grape Lane, so you'll know where I'm going to be leading with this one now. Um, so before that, my dad is actually going to be shuddering in his kitchen while he's drinking his coffee when I say this out loud, but before that, it was called Grape Cunt Alley, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, that is the truth. Streets around that time, um, they were just named on the trade that was happening on the street. So the more wholesome street names are still out there today. You know, Poultry Lane, uh, Bread Street. But we had to sort of change those ones along with the times. So, yeah. <laughs> a yeah. lot of that going on. <laughs> and, uh, and what Amanda's forgot to mention, when I said that's lovely, this big tall tower block, she used to work at the top of it. A very, very well-known bar in London called Paramount. Man Amanda opened and managed for a couple of years before joining us and working on great places. And when we were speaking, I was like, you're on this toughest, lovely tower, which has got great panoramic views all over London. I said, you know what you're on, you're s where you're above right now? This was like the biggest mm -hmm. dump in London at one time yep. with prostitution, gin palace, gin shops more, 
that kind of people coming out from theatres and theatre gaiety, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Mr. Miles knows more about it than me because he has a theatre background and he knows that some of the day, you know, people were, you look at the pictures here, there's, there's men in there, there's children, there's well-dressed men, top hats, looking very smart, well-dressed. They were there for one thing, to pick up some women. Drink gin, get drunk, pick up women. What we're going to go moving to with Jim, before Gin Palace Designs again is that kind of think your mind, kind of island bars or horseshoe bars, clocks, very ornate. These are very opulent establishments. They were, I guess they, they gave the, the, the working class of that part of London a sense of grandeur. Bring them from out of the slums, bring them from the gin shops. They were drawn in by the gas lights outside. Charles Dickens, uh, Dave's got a bit of read about the importance of the big gas lamps outside. They were lovely lights. They brought people into this wonderful world of a place where they can get drunk quite cheaply, have fun, meet other people, a lot of socialising, and they were drinking in what was pretty much beautiful places, which you've never seen before. And hence why we came from gin shop to gin palace. And that was a big turning point. And it was a gin palaces later on, which started to die out, the original ones, and then were taken over by brewers because the beer gave rise to beer consumption again. And uh, brewers throughout London started buying up gin palaces and then making various Victorian pubs. So the public house of the day. But the interesting thing for me is that gin shops were a public place. So we had coaching inns, we had taverns, you know, we had all these different names of places, L houses. We didn't have a pub until gin shops turned to gin palace because they were public places. And then we had the pub. So the Victorian pub was born out of that. So some are still have the hallmarks of original gin palace, which we'll show you some. But it's, it's a fascinating journey of that transition from what was seen as, you know, the end of life in London to something that actually we're getting a bit of respectability slowly. We're coming back to having a sense of grandeur and understanding what's going on within, within our society. This one there, this Miles. Mr. Miles. So yeah, so Charles Dickens, he wrote really nicely about the Gym Palace and describing it and capturing some of the, the moral outrage that was still attached to anything to do with drinking at the time. And it's important, not just because Dickens is a really great writer, but because he cared. He was a real activist, he was a social reformer. The reason he wrote so passionately about the standards of living that people had was because he wanted to change things. So this is just a, this is an extract from Sketches by Boz, which was published in 1836. And he's just talking about the gym palace now. The primary symptoms were an inordinate love of plate glass and a passion for gaslights and gilding. The extensive scale on which these places are established and the ostentatious manner in which the business of even the smallest among them is divided into branches is amusing. A handsome plate of ground glass in one door directs you to the counting house, another to the bottle department, a third to the wholesale department, a fourth to the wine promenade, and so forth until we are in daily expectation of meeting with a brandy bell or a whiskey entrance. Then ingenuity is exhausted in devising attractive titles for the different descriptions of gin. And the dram drinking portion of the community as they gaze upon the gigantic black and white announcements which are only to be equaled in size by the figures beneath them are left in a state of pleasing hesitation between the cream of the valley, the out and out, the no mistake, the good for mixing, the real knock-me-down, the celebrated butter gin, the regular flare-up, and a dozen other equally inviting and wholesome liqueurs. Although places of this description are to be met with in every second street, they are invariably numerous and splendid in precise proportion to the dirt and poverty of the surrounding neighbourhood. The gin shops in and near Drury Lane, Hoburn, St Giles's, Covent Garden and Clare Market are the handsomest in London. There is more of filth and squalid misery near these great thoroughfares than in any part of this mighty city. We will endeavour to sketch the bar of a large gin shop and its ordinary customers for the edification of such of our readers as may not have had opportunities of observing such scenes. And on the chance of finding one well suited to our purpose, we will make for Drury Lane, through the narrow streets and dirty courts which divide it from Oxford Street and that classical spot adjoining the brewery at the bottom of Tottenham Court Road, best known to the initiated as the Rookery. All is light and brilliancy. The hum of many voices issues from that splendid gin shop which forms the commencement of the two streets opposite. 
And the gay building with the fantastically <coughs> ornamented parapet, the illuminated clock, the plate glass windows, surrounded by stucco rosettes and its profusion of gaslights in richly gilt burners, is perfectly dazzling when contrasted with the darkness and dirt we have just left. The interior is even gayer than the exterior. A bar of French polished mahogany, elegantly carved, extends the whole width of the place. And there are two side aisles of great casks, painted green and gold, enclosed within a light brass rail and bearing such inscriptions as Old Tom, 549, Young Tom, 360, Samson, 1421. The figures agreeing, we presume, with gallons, understood. Beyond the bar is a lofty and spacious saloon full of the same enticing vessels, with a gallery running round it, equally well furnished. And then he goes on to the curse of all of our lives, it gets at some point, closing time. It is growing late, and the throng of men, women, and children who have been constantly going in and out dwindles down to two or three occasional stragglers, cold, wretched-looking creatures in the last stage of emaciation and disease. The knot of Irish laborers at the lower end of the place who have been alternately shaking hands with and threatening the life of each other for the last hour become furious in their disputes and, finding it impossible to silence one man who is particularly anxious to adjust the difference, they resort to the expedient of knocking him down and jumping on him afterwards. <laughs> the man in the fur cap and the pot boy rush out. A scene of riot and confusion ensues. Half the Irishmen get shut out, the other half get shut in. The pot boy is knocked among the tubs in no time. The landlord hits everybody, everybody hits the landlord. <laughs> the barmaid scream, the police come in. The rest is a confused mixture of arms, legs, staves, torn coats, shouting and struggling. Some of the party are borne off to the station house and the remainder slink home to beat their wives for complaining and kick the children for daring to be hungry. <laughs> so that was Dickens on both what the Gin palaces for the day were I think that like. deserves a round of applause, doesn't it? <laughs> and as you'll know, Charles Dickens was a real hero of the day. He often travelled over here to the United States to do, you know, readings to thousands of people. He was a real rock star, the guy, you know, and his, his, his books are wonderful and uh, I'm a fan of it. But that, that image of Gin Palace started when I read Sketchy by Boz and that, that transcript, I was like, that's got me thinking a lot more about the designs and what was going on around the area of the time. And when you see there yeah, certain drinks, we know the big barrels, which a man is going to come into in a moment with the, the drinks. But, you know, we're talking about mixed drinks. London was drinking from the early 1800s, many mixed drinks. And one of them you had earlier just now was an old drink from uh, which we actually done with uh, Bowles Geneva. But anyone ha heard of gin in it? It's, basically, it's a short for gin in Italian. And I go on to why that's important and significant, because my grandmother mother drank gin in it. And... Uh, she was, saw two world, you know, World First State and Second World War, and she died in 1985, you know, but she just spoke to me before, not knowing about, oh, I'd like a bit of gin in it. And it was gin in Italian. Everyone thinks it's like a post-World War drink. It's not. That drink, I'm telling you, comes from the early 1800s, and I wouldn't be surprised if one of them barrels, you had gin in it. Because roof was available, which I'll go into in a moment. Port, we know, was available. Ginger was available. Gin and it is still actually drunk by the Queen Mother over in England. It was uh, also drunk by, um, it's also drunk by the Queen. So at three o'clock every afternoon, they have a little pint glass of, uh, of gin and Dubonnet still to this day. <laughs> Another interesting fact about what Dickens um, wrote there and what David put out so wonderfully was it spoke about the different aspects of the bar. So what you had was uh, takeout shops as well. And anyone who's familiar with London pubs, we used to have off-licenses next door inside the pub. And that came from Gin Palace. So you could buy off-trade, you get bottlings to take home. You know, Sunday afternoon, the pubs were shut at three, you could take something back and you can get money back to bring the bottle back, refill it again. So you had that start of, uh, again, what we had in Victorian London and, 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 and public houses was the off-license. And you still get a few old pubs around that have the off-license attached, uh, which is nice to see, but they become then a separate... Uh, idea. So again, that, inst that, that, that was to totally wholly inspired, I believe, by uh, Jim Paddy's behaviour. So, we all know that sort of bottled cocktails at the moment, uh, barrel ageing is bang on trend and has been for the last sort of five years or so, but where does that actually stem from? Um, I think we believe that it stems from the old Gin Palace days. So if you look at the picture just to the right, you can see the little boy at the front of the bar with his empty bottle. 
he's going to get his uh, pre-made drink, a compound, um, for his parents to take back home. Obviously, the laws have changed a little bit. I'm not allowed to do that anymore, but children were quite, ha quite happy for them to go into the bar and pick up drinks for their parents. Now, they said that in the States that they dispense spirits and compounds. And what do they mean by compounds? Uh, it, mixed drinks. Um, two mixed drinks in a barrel, maybe, at the back of the bar there. And as it states on the big, big barrels on the back, maybe sort of 500-gallon you know, barrels, you're not actually ever sure what's actually in them. They have, as Wayne said before, they've got some really strange names with them. In and out, I mean, what, what is that? <laughs> but I strongly believe this is sort of the birth of, of bottle-aged cocktails, um, barrel-aged cocktails, as they were back in the day. Have you seen this one on the left, John, with the bowls? Um, Very old. No, I haven't seen it, but I think the reason, um, the reason it's next to that, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever been to Holland or been to Amsterdam, um, but there's these bars that uh, some of them are, have been around for sort of five, six hundred years, and they're still in their original state. They haven't been touched. And uh, it's quite often, to it's quite, it's quite uh, a common thing to see these old bars called proflocals, which have this same look. So they have barrels on the, on the side of the bar, and then uh, like you can, you can basically buy a barrel and you just keep it there. So we have one, like Bowles as a company has a barrel and on the side it says Geneva and then it's got a little a lock and it's got Bowles written on it and we take our key and you go along and you fill it up from the barrel yourself. And uh, no one actually dispenses it for you. You just go and grab it and uh, unlock it, fill up, have a drink and then lock it back up again and, and disappear. Now, another interesting thing about that scene in that gin palace, so the, it's got gin shop, that's another Cruikshank drawing, I believe, yes? Yeah. Um, everyone is standing. These bars, gin palaces, never had, you can see the lovely, again, the Roman columns in the back and the very ornate stucco on the ceiling and various things. The landlords in the background, the barmaids at the front, she's pulling off basically mixed, co mixed drinks, if you like, sorry, it's a cocktail, but mixed drinks from a tap, with brass tap, which runs up to each of the barrels, and it's pull them off and people will pay, you know, a penny a cup or whatever it may be of the day. And you see the gentleman there with the top hat leaning against the bar, chatting up the barmaid. Nothing's changed again today. Yeah. And uh, you know what you have there, you get, you've got the horseshoe bar, there's no seating. They never had seating for a reason. They wanted to get them in, get them out. Come in, get your drink, move to the next gin palace or you know, dram shop. And you know, they, the diet was very bad at the time. Me being an old costa monger and a, and a, a, a street trader, uh, when I grew up, we used to have uh, outside of pubs around Camden Town where I'm from, we had fish stalls outside on a Saturday and Sunday. And you go out there and you go to the fish store and you get some, you know, jelly deals or you get some cockles and mussels with vinegar. Anyone had cockles or mussels? Yeah? Just really small and winkles, the other ones are called. I always, I always have a go at David because he, he wears winkle pickers, as in the boots, you know, that like Sonny Bono used to wear. And uh, we were discussing about why they're called winkle pickers. I said because the guys used to wear them and go along the beach and kick the sand and flick up all the little uh, cockles and mussels which are on the bay. He said, no, it was actually a... a no, it's because winkles are really small little crustaceans, so you need a little spiky implement just to be able to get the winkle out of its shell. That's David, can you show us your boots, please? So you, <laughs> you need you need something <laughs> that, that looks like that to be able to get your winkle out of it. You need a winkle picker. So that's why boots like this are called shoes Wink. like that are called winkle pickers. Yeah, fascinating. Jim Palace again. But just going back to that picture, this is all relevant with what's happening with the sort of bar trade today. I mean, you've got barrel-aged cocktails, like pre-batch bottle cocktails that they're taking out off license. And then, I mean, more currently, what people are doing at the moment is cocktails on draft, which, if you look at the picture, that was precisely what was happening with sort of two or more compounds at the time. Yeah. And uh, the, the next drink you've got, actually, is um, gin and ginger. And what we try to do is, we, we know now from uh, great historic drinks historians, you know, like Dave Wondrich and Jared Brown, Anastasia Miller, and then when they discovered that the word cocktail was first printed in London in 1798 in a, in a public house near Downing Street on some, I guess, um, politician's slate. And again, the words like slate, you know, it was a roof slate. They put it behind a bar. We got lots of terms that come out, well, born out of London, we use very commonly today. A slate was behind a bar, you've got a chalk, and you write on a slate, and so you say, I'll have something put on the slate, and that means you're going to run a tab, and then things like that. Going back to, you know, uh, the early days of when taverns were very popular in medieval times, and you had things like where we get wet the whistle from. You've probably heard all that phrase as well. Wet the whistle comes from, you used to have a porcelain mug with a whistle on the end, and because there was no bar, the bar was a barrier. 
which was a counter, which people served from. Before the barrier came into existence, you basically just had hatches, and people, Brewsters or women would serve beer through a hatch, hence down the hatch as well. But if you couldn't get the Brewster, you'd whistle it into cup, and you wanted a refill, so you go and wet your whistle. So all these things have all, all, all originated from you know, drinking uh, establishments in and around London and up to Gym Palace. And so I always find that quite fascinating because of the food is, uh, that was served was brought from the Thames. It was basically, you know, crustaceans, if you like, and food like that. The seafood stalls still exist in some London pubs. And that's kind of another culture and that which is born and tradition and was born out of a Gym Palace design and, and what it's about. The drink on the top, on the right, yeah, the right, right. hand side, is called Out and Out. Now, when I was talking about that print of um, the first word co term cocktail was used in London, and you know it was, it, it was probably born, it, it was probably conceived in London a cocktail, but probably you know dressed up and presented well and jazzed all around the world by the Americans, of course. But you know we have that now the first definition, that first use of the term cocktail coming from the, the London Post, the Morning Gazetteer in 1798, and uh, Jared Brown and Anastasia Miller they think that that drink was based on gin bitters. And because there was in brackets vulgarly called ginger, it may have had something ginger in it. So again, gin palace drinks, a common drink was gin in it, and also gin and ginger. So what you've got in your cups here is basically what we've called an out and out, because we don't know if it's in there, because we don't know what's in the barrel, but we're just going to put it out there. But um, gin and ginger. <laughs> to make it easy for everyone. This gin has actually been but was pressed by the kitchen this morning, so it's quite fiery. But it's using number three gin, um, some bitters, and some fresh ginger with sugar. So I hope you enjoy that one. Are you enjoying the drinks? Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let Amanda do this one because I know she wants to talk about what's the what is yeah, it said. I've said enough vulgarities today. <laughs> <laughs> the poor young lady. This was the um, one of the first stones in your wine. Why this is significant to Gin Palace is that stones was. Um, was, was, was brought out at a time by uh, Nicholson's at one time, and obviously Booster Distillery was in and around Clerkenwell. Clerkenwell was a big part of uh, North London where main distilleries, old lost distilleries, were, were based. And people, uh, other distilleries like Tanker and Gordon moved over there. Gilby's was over in Camden Town. But when you think of great gin brands like Booth's, you know, Nicholson's, these, these distilleries were based around Clerkenwell because they had great water source. They had the Regent's Canal runs right by, and you need to have that water source because we were in a part of industrial revolution at the time as well, and before the steam train started coming in, everything was taken around the country by horse, and they used to do it by canal boats, and the horses would pull the canal boats up through the canals of uh, the Regent's Canal and on to places like Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, and so forth, and they also distribute gin. But I'm going to move over here. Actually, David, do you want to take this so I don't get on the yeah, thing? So you read it from there? And for some of them, if you can't quite read it from the back, but back in the days when advertising didn't have to be maybe quite as truthful as it's required to be now. <laughs> so, Stone's Ginger Wine possesses the many qualities extracted from ginger. It increases virility in men. It stimulates the appetite. It increases the sex drive. Restores lost energy. Increases blood flow. I think we know where we're going with that one. Cures coughs and colds, is a general health tonic, well there we go, and is a refreshing, vitalizing drink. But yeah, I don't think we could get away with much of that nowadays, but uh, I enjoy disagree it in with there. That one. If you go over to the Caribbean, uh, Jamaica especially, you've actually still got a lot of the sort of bitter long drinks and they actually state that on the front still, <laughs> just, just not in uh, England. <laughs> I like that strap line on the bottom, stay up with stones, you know, so... If you're out tonight and you want to get another one of these on the way out, because there's a big tub of it over there, you might, you might go into Bourbon Street and find out you're, done, you're going to do all right. <laughs> now, interesting one, going back to gin and it. In Clarkenwell, I said uh, classic distilleries, or early distilleries of Clarkenwell, Finsbury, as we know, Finsbury Gin, and Booth's, kind of a bit forgotten now, and Nicholson, and they're all relevant with different things, the way they intertwine with different social aspects of history. This was London's first, like, Little Italy. Um, this was a, a place in Clark, and we still have on near to hold with a place called Sicilian Avenue, which is very beautifully designed. These are actually, this is from the, the Clark and Wall History paper, and this is uh, Italian ice cream sellers outside the distillery selling ice cream on a hot summer's afternoon. Now, these Italians who came over, they, they, were, they were leather made, they made leather goods, that's why we have Leather Lane, just off the, opposite the, actually the Italian church in Clark and Wall. 
they were uh, watchmakers, and a whole area of Clerkenwell and Smithfield and that was all about watchmakers and silversmiths and various things. They were very crafty people. They opened a lot of, you know, restaurants, and they opened um, uh, different uh, wine shops and stuff and brought their goods over with them. This is the early 1800s. So I know for sure because we know that, you know, Carpano Vermouth was already uh, well into its uh, bottling that from Italy and from many, many years before that. So they would have bought fine Italian wines and the vermouths with them. So to me, it's kind of plausible to say that, yeah, one of them barrels probably had gin and Italian vermouth because Italians were around the distilleries and they always worked together and, you know, to promote drinks and the ways of serving. And then you think of the, the, the 20th century and you get gin and it appearing more on people's lungs. I think it goes further back. I do think gin and it is a gin palace cocktail. And uh, Amanda will touch on what a gin and it actually one we had, what is actually what it is. What gin and it? Oh, well, this one, or out now. You mentioned from the, the American version. Oh, well, well, the Martinez. So, I mean, maybe that was the start of the Martinez. That sort of evolved from there. That, that's England's answer to the Martinez, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> a lot quicker it to make. It, it actually predates the Martinez. If, it's, if, it's, if it's factual and we go to Gin Palace, it will de predate a Martinez too. Yeah. And even now, you know, think of it as like a sweet martini and uh, these drinks which are so commonly placed. You know, we, did, we don't know what these drinks were, these with different various names they had and bizarre names too. I mean, at one time, Nicholson's brought out a, a, a gin called Lamplighter, you know, and it sold bundles and bundles at one time in the yeah, yeah, um, early part of that time. Now, unfortunately, 1860s, the original gin palace of Thompson and Fernand was demolished to make way for the Holborn Viaduct. But it's quite an important and significant part as well because another gin palace style uh, building was built straight after that, which we're gonna go into in a one, one which is still standing. Now, the whole viaduct was actually London's first flyover, and in Britain's basically first flyover. And it, you know, you can see the procession, the Queen was there when they opened it. But Thompson and Fearon's Gin Palace, original one, and as well as on Old Street, further down, they were the two ones which were significant. They were taken down, unfortunately, they probably didn't realize what they were about, what they were gonna be. They had to make way for industrial uh, revolution was coming, more improvements to roads and transport. And building this flyover was a big thing. So that was what Holborn Hill was, where they had Holborn Hill. And old maps of London show Holborn Hill, and you see now the viaduct replaces it. But it's, uh, if anyone goes to London, it's a, it's a beautiful bridge. It's a lovely um, flyover itself. It goes from you know, Holborn to actually right into the city of London itself, or the financial district. So now we're moving on to Jim Palace design and its influence, how it expands. The picture of the, I say Jim Palace still, that's a public house privately owned by a, a, a big company called Samuel Smith. If you look at the design of it in the original ones, that's Princess Louise on, on Holborn. That's a beautiful, beautiful example of a gym palace. And I'm going to go there. The, 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 top, the top picture, you can see the hallway. You know, you've got that ceramic tiling, very ornate, mosaic floors, etched glass, gilt mirrors. I mean, it's a thing of beauty. This is what the, were the hallmarks of what gym palace design was. You can see the, the, the work in the corner of the, of the, by the mirrors and the top and that. They were very, very, very opulent. Below is uh, Leadenhall Market, which is a wonderful place in the city of London. And it's believed that Leadenhall Market's design was inspired because of the grandeur of the Gym Palace designs. And it, there is similarities, because you look at the way the, the dome in the pillars and the coloring, it was just this rich, burning glow of, of, of opulence. And, uh, and that's where we kind of get the Gym Palace thing starts. So if anyone goes to London, go to Holborn, go into the Princess Louise, a wonderful, wonderful place. You will be astonished when you walk through the door and you walk down that corridor and you just see this beautiful tiling. It's, uh, it's unreal. And they've, 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 they've restored it and they've put it back to its former glory. And the last time it was properly restored was in 1890. And again, recently, I think it was up to 1985, I think. They've done more work to bring it back to let people know this is what Jim Palace was, what it would have looked like. This is what Charles Dickens wrote about. Big gas lamps outside, drawing you in, warming side, opulent, you know, uh, grand. Grandeur is, a, is a, I guess, the word for it. The toilets are original, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, I took it. You've been down, have you? The toilets, yeah. Yeah. you still got the, the, the Victorian grate underneath. About the thing with the... Yeah. The, no, I was going to ask you to tell He's me. He's having a go at me now. What, no, I'm waiting about, for um, as I'd, ne I'd never been before, and before we, were, when we were planning uh, this session, we all met up in London, and we, we well, thought, why not go to the Princess Louise? And uh, Wayne pointed out, something which I'd never seen before, which is to do with the toilets, um, that uh, the, the, the guys who would, who would go would might be a bit rotund. Portly. Uh, a bit portly. 
and they have um, they have these big like uh, porcelain like in the, uri the urinals. We actually, when Amanda's going to take you through some other part, I mean, you've got a picture of, of the urinal, not in London, pub, but in Liverpool. But yeah, the, the shape of the urinals was because they just basically plops it out and just leant forward on the and marble, then, and it stops you. So and, you just and, and then and you actually, when you stand there, you look That's and go. Great. And John, John said that actually makes sense because you also got this lovely iron grating underneath, which you just watch your pee fly underneath into the sewer. <laughs> and the toilet's there. So people go to gym and go, have you, seen, have you been to gents' toilets? And it, sometimes you go and you might get your, your poor early businessman is in there on a Friday night and you often see him like that. <laughs> just leaning through and you look at the shape, you look at the shape of the, the urinal and you go, yeah, that's just to be comfortable and just lean yeah. and let it go. Bring them back. <laughs> So, oh, sorry, um, I'm sure you agree. Again, uh, French mahogany, the clock, significant horseshoe bar. Uh, look, that's part of the back bar. I'm sure you see that's pretty beautiful, isn't it? It's absolutely stunning. If you go to London, please go there because it will blow your mind. Yep. Viaduct Tavern, another great example of a gym palace. This is when the Viaduct, um, Holborn Viaduct was built and they knocked down the original gym palace. This round building in the corner is right opposite what was Newgate. Um, prison, and which now become the Old Bailey Courthouse, the famous courthouse in London. But if you look at some of the design, what's interesting about this one was on that picture at the back, on the right-hand side, at the back there's the, where the clock is, there's this overhanging entrance, if you can see on this picture on the left, of glass and just hanging, doing nothing. That was like a ticket office. Because they were next to Newgate Prison and a courthouse, people who were in London at the time drinking, they had to go in and buy tokens from a woman behind there and they have a certain amount of gin so they can monitor how much they were actually drinking because they didn't want to seem too drunk because when you go outside, you're opposite the courthouse and you yeah, obviously going to get arrested. Again, the bottom picture shows, again, the island, that horseshoe island-style bar, lots of marbling, very uh, opulent and uh, beautiful surroundings. And the thing about this, that cellars, if anyone goes to the Holborn Viaduct, they have a thing on the wall which tells you about the history of the bar, of the bar and, and, again, about Gin Palace. And they allow you to go down to see their cellars because their cellars now where they store their beers were actually prisons from Newgate Prison once before. And you can see the shape of the arch from the prison. So obviously that, that link between putting prisons up through a tunnel into a gym palace, the connection doesn't seem to work out so well. Salisbury in Common Garden. Uh, and this was built first in 1830 redone again, I think, in uh, 1885. Uh, again, look at the entrance, grand. It's in your face. It's there. It's huge. The lamps inside are very beautiful. Uh, it reminds me of when uh, we're down here and you go into somewhere like uh, French 75 and you've got a lovely mahogany wood and you've got those lovely little monkey lamps. Now, I know it's Art Deco, but look at Gym Palace, that glowing, glaring lights and glass and, you know, the etched glass. And the actual, believe it or not, the mirrors were gilt and the glasses were etched because they were so bright with gas lights it was the only way they could calm out down the brightness in the, in the bar of the gym palace. So it was there for a reason of actually letting the glare, take some of the glare away from the actual lighting. I love this place. This is in Maidavell, uh, in West London, this Prince Alfred. How beautiful is that frontage of bow windows and, and you know, etched glass? And then what's really historic about this one, is it's down the bottom here, again, you've got that kind of horseshoe bar, big clock in the middle. You've got different compartments, which, which they call snugs. And we know we've got different bars have snugs and that. At the top, if you see the little windows that push around and open, they're called snobs. So if you're in a bar and you're next to one of these places and you didn't want the bar person to hear what you're talking about or the person next to you in the other snug, you shut the glass and you were called a snob. And that kind of where snobbery comes from as well. Gym Palace, you're welcome. <laughs> Why, why I say it's the reason why we put these in here because Jim Palace uh, in influence and inspiration it, it grew out of London and other places and uh, although Amanda is a lovely lady they, they weren't going to put it in there but I kicked off because I'm from the north so, that's um, right <laughs> I was about to say it but I was going to say it a lot more but um, in a nice uh, more of a London's not the only way. place in England um, there's some beautiful <laughs> examples of Jim Palaces outside of London um, so you've got oh, the Crown uh, Belfast I don't know if any of you have been to Belfast this place is absolutely breathtaking mm. Um, just, uh, yeah, the design of it is phenomenal. So you've got the Crown Belfast just there. And then you've got the Gym Palace in Dublin. I haven't actually had the pleasure of going to this one, but look at it. Absolutely beautiful. And that you're starting also... to see this trend coming back in design in bars at the moment, as we said before. There's a Philharmonic uh, in Liverpool, which is also another stunning place. 
If you just see the urinals just on the top right-hand side, that's what we were talking about. They sort of come right up to chest height, so there's no chance of you missing them. <laughs> you, sorry, Amanda, just cut in there. Yeah. I was uh, up there recently into the Philharmonic with my, my missus, and I said, look, Sunday afternoon, I've got to go for a pint, because this pub's beautiful. I want to see it. I want you to see this. Mm -hmm. Again, mosaic floor, beautiful island bar. It's a stunning place. It was finished in 1895. Most women go in there and actually go to gents to go toilet because they want to see the, the gents' toilets. That's one of the most... They say, did you see the toilets? Oh, I went in the toilet. So when I was in there, the barman said to my, my missus, she said, uh, do you want to go to your gents' toilet? She went, can I? He went, yeah, go in, don't worry about it. <laughs> so she checked the door, she went in, she came back, she goes, oh my God, why aren't the ladies like that? Yeah. You know? Apparently, at the at Beatles, at the height of their fame, someone said to John Lennon, what's the worst thing about being famous? And his reply was, I can't go to the fill for a pint on a Sunday afternoon. Hmm. And on, actually on that one as well, that picture is not very clear, but if you see here, you've got on the, this is when you come into the world towards the dining area, you've got these other two kind of sections off, which are called Brahms and List. Obviously, if I knew, but Brahms and List is, is old Cockney rhyming slang for being pissed. I'm Brahms and List. And so it's nice they got that in there because that goes back again, Gin Palace influence. Ah, a few quirky facts for a couple of you on uh, uh, Lost London Gin Distilleries, Hodges. From the late 18th century into the 19th century, Hodges was a, a distillery producing mainly grain alcohol, then producing gin, then producing vinegar. But Frederick, Captain Frederick Hodges also was, a, was fascinated with London fires and the fires of what took London ablaze of those times and how to control them. And he actually put from the distillery, he built the first watchtower, if you like, clock, a tall watchtower to look over London, which they use today in many places to spot fires. And he started the first London's private fire brigade, you know. And so you think about a gin distiller who supplies gin to gin palaces, starts up a fire brigade. And you kind of go, what well, these connections are just kind of bizarre. Booth Gin, as we know, the famous explorer is Sir Felix Booth. He was from the Booth family of um, wine traders originally, doing uh, wonderful gin distillers. And they were based in Clerkenwell. And one of um, Booth's, um, uh, I think, uh, brothers or, or nephews went on to open another distillery in, in Regent's Park. Um, which, we, which was joined with William Grimble, and the, the gin distillery didn't work, so they just stuck to making vinegar. And then Grimble vinegar was quite a household name throughout the UK, a bit like Tabasco sauce over here. You know, you have probably Sarsons is probably the best one known, but Grimble's was the one of the most common vinegars you'd have come out of making from a gin distillery. And, and the, the other interesting thing about that now is that where it was stood on Cumberland Market was taken down, and now it's a territorial army base. So we've got fire brigade, we've had police, Territorial Army, see a pattern building, prostitution. Nicholson's um, is another interesting one because uh, William Nicholson was a, was a politician, a distiller as well, and he, he was uh, very re revered and he, he set up the first uh, Marylebone Cricket Club. They, yeah, right, Marylebone Cricket Club. And if you look at any old bottles of Nicholson's gin, they've got the red and the yellow um, stripes. And if anyone is a fan of cricket, you go to Lord's Cricket Ground, which he also founded, it was a founding member for Maribyrne Cricket Club. Lord's Cricket Ground is one of the most, probably the most famous cricket ground in the world. And they wear the, the jackets are yellow and red stripes. So you're getting a connection between gin and um, um, gin palaces. Because Nicholson's was, at a time when they were producing gin, when gin palaces started to fold and the popularity dropped, he bought a load of gin palaces around London and then turned them into Victorian pubs. Mm -hmm. So when you go to London, you'll see Nicholson's pub that comes from William Nicholson. So there's many of them throughout London, and they're all beautiful, and they're all very, very well preserved, and they are a wonderful place to go and visit, and various things. And, uh, and you're all familiar with cricket, aren't you? <laughs> it's, it's where you get baseball from, basically. <laughs> <laughs> it's the bigger bat. <laughs> and um, something quite close to my heart in Camden Town, Gilby's. Um, Walter Gilby started Gilby's Gin. He, again, was a merchant based in Oxford Street first, then moved to bigger premises in Camden. This is actually the still house in, uh, in Gilby's, which was one now. Anyone been to London, gone to Camden Market, and you see the famous Stables Market all around there. That whole area there, Stables Market, is all to do with uh, Gilby. They, they, they built the first tr turnstile train, steam train, um, by Isambard Kingdom, uh, the great industrial uh, pioneer. For actually, so we can go north to take products out of London. So Gilby's grew, and at one time, Gilby's was the biggest uh, gin distillery, gin house in the whole of London. Most of it now is turned into um, 
you know, a, a, a marketplace and various things where the, the, the canals there are beautiful. What's really interesting about Gilby's is there's two very fascinating facts to me about it. One of the warehouses is, is, is now called the Henson Warehouse or Henson Apartments, which runs along by a, a Gilby's Yard. And one part of it is a film studio. Nicholson's also had another film studio in, over in East London, which they use for very many different television productions. And uh, Henson Buildings or Henson Apartments is Jim Henson. That's where he created the Muppets. Was in those warehouses at Gilby's uh, Distillery or warehousing. The other fa fascinating fact about G uh, Gilby's and Camden is that Gil Walter Gilby's grandson Hugh Gilby in 1905 created a soda stream from Camden and Gin Street. So now we've got soda stream. We're talking effervescence, quick fizzy drinks, gin. Bang on trend right now. Yeah. <laughs> and we're all looking like Muppets. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, just to finish on a couple of little things here before we have a bit of Q&A, I wanted to show you this because this to me is, was the most beautiful example of a gym palace. One of the biggest ones, they say one of the most beautifully designed. Uh, there's a couple of pictures in books. If, you, if anyone gets a book called Lost London, they'll show you images of the dining room and stuff inside. Absolutely beautiful. It was called the Leicester. It got damaged in World War II, bad damage. Instead of restoring it, they took it down. And what you have in this place today is friggin' M&M world. M &M world. I don't understand. Where's the justice gone? <laughs> and Gilby's then and now. Again, the horrible transformation. I'm going to try and lean over here because I'm going to try and show you this part here where the old steel house was. This whole yard, you've got the, the famous roundhouse music place where lots of big famous bands play. The Doors have played there, Beatles, and Elvis Presley was booked to play there until unfortunately he died and didn't make it over, which is very sad. But it's now become a very popular music place in Camden. Uh, you know, God rest his soul, Amy Winehouse is a great Camden singer. And so many different bands come out of Camden, like Madness and The Kinks and various things. And they've all played the Roundhouse. But that was part of, I say, this, this train turnstile which went north. But this whole area here is now what is Camden Market and Camden Lock. And uh, if you see to the right, this is the old still house of Gilby's. It's now called Cyberdog. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> Just before we move on to this one as well, I think what's, what, what I feel is going on at the moment, you've got all these beautiful establishments, all the sort of interior of them are sort of Jim Palace-esque, or they've been either refurbed or, you know, the stuff, uh, original stuff from the sort of far ago days. What lets them down a little bit in our day and age is because of they got taken over by free houses quite a long time ago, is the service in them. So you go into these beautiful sort of grand places and you get a lady behind the bar, you ask for a gin and tonic, what, what's that? Um, you get it with a little dry piece of lime and one ice cube floating at the top of the drink. So what I'd really like to see is the sort of service matching the sort of beautifulness of the interior with them. As the gentleman over there says, you've got a lot of sort of bars nodding to the sort of Victorian era or the gym palaces that are starting to pop up now like Pearl in London where you know the drinks are fantastic um, the interior of them is just phenomenal but I would like to see the sort of service standards and these sort of gym palace guest bars across the country sort of improving slightly over the next couple of years. Now this um, last picture here is, um, I just put that nice, I love that, um, this actually came from one of our marketeers, but I think it's brilliant, and it's in the books you have with, uh, mix it with gin in Geneva. Tragedy, squalor, snobbery, valor. It's a, it's a nice thing about, sums up gin in a sentence for me very nicely. The key thing about gin, and gin palaces and its categories, no other city in the world has such a deep rooted connection with any spirit category like London does. You can think of anywhere you want, I'll challenge anyone to that. The inter in how it, history intertwines with one thing to another. The social aspects from the, you know, come from the gut. It was a real rags to riches story, back to rags again. You know, it's just it's a, the change in, in society and history based around gin is actually quite outstanding. As we've seen things like examples of Soda Stream, you know, Muppets and Eminem World. You know, it just doesn't stop. So that, that is basically what London's gin and its connections are. You know, you're welcome. <laughs> no. I thought it was a nice picture to end on because this is the Metropolitan Meat Market quite close to Camden near me in, in North London. This is on the border of Camden and Islington. And that behind it was one of the biggest, grandest Gym Palace hotels. And that's where the Gym Palace apartments are now. Half the building has been taken away, unfortunately, due to damage. And uh, I said the famous artist, Damien Hurst, has a, a studio in there. So people go past and say, oh, the Gym Palace apartments are really nice. And you try to tell people what they're about. I drank in that place as a 20-year-old 20 year man. And I didn't know at that time what it was. I do now. And I wish I could go back and visit. So we've got a um, little bit of time for questions, if anyone has any, on the floor. 
please, uh, please fire him over. Yeah. I mean, I, there's always been women in bars and always will be, and that's where it should be. You've got, to have that, you know, you've got to have that nice balance. But it's interesting because in L houses, you had the Brewsters, they used to make beer, and they were women. They would normally kept behind a hatch, unfortunately, and they'd come out and serve people when they wanted serving. But they used to make, you know, if you go back historically, the old L house itself, and when, used to, when, when we got the first pub signs, if you like, they used to put, you know, a, 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 a stack of hops on a stick outside a house, I meaning to let people know it's an L house. And that was the first kind of pub sign. And when you move on, you see various pub signs over the years kind of start to develop and grow. A lot of pubs have a picture and a name. And the reason they have that is because a lot of people today were very literate. So when you went to the White Horse, you need to have a picture of the White Horse. So you knew where you were going. And it's funny how, but in London, traditionally, old Victorian pubs, they had barmaids. That's what they were called. It wasn't that you were trying to be, you know, there was no sexualization or being disrespect, being disrespectful. It was just the way you think, barmaids. Today, everyone's bartender. But I actually, in London, believe it or not, some women actually go, oh, you're barmaid. They get offended by it. I think it's more of a term of endearment than anything else. Amanda? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> it's quite interesting. Were any of you at David Wondrich's session yesterday on women behind bars? Yeah, great. So I think it's a really nice tie-in with, obviously, they were talking about sort of uh, barmaids, female bartenders, and the uprising of them in America, where this is a great tie-in with the sort of London, what was happening over here with bartenders, barmaids at the time. Um, yeah. Really interesting. I think the reality is even today, you know, if you go into a bar, they always say, even in bars now, the reality is sometimes you're in a bar and you've got bar operators who say, like, no, you get some, they have rent a crowd sometimes, get some good models in, in the middle of Covent Garden, get them in on the Friday evening about six o'clock, let's get 10 or 12 beautiful looking girls and the men will come. Yeah, that's just the, that's the nature of what, what it oh, is about. Awesome. But we're seeing more and more, um, great to see now more and more female bartenders i think in particularly in london working in great bars because if i go back 10 years ago it was very male dominated without a doubt um yeah i just wanted to add to um to i guess trying to uh, attack your question quite specifically um which is i take the question that's the wrong way of praying uh, we're skirting around uh, it. the uh i think the transition is one of a obviously a domestic one to an industrialized one so um the movement of the idea of the uh, the female ale brewer or innkeeper um, would be more in line with something I'd align it with the craft brewery pub today, yeah. whereas the 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 beer production thing that was that was coming over from Holland was very much about industrializing the process and one about business. Women could could run houses and taverns because they're adept at keeping houses, but they can't run business. That was the the mentality that they were that they were fighting against. Um, I don't know. Maybe now we see a, a we'll see a, a a resurgence of that. Um, but that J Julie Rayner is going to get you. Julie Rayner is going to get me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that uh, that beer production thing was and and still is. I mean, if you look at European beer culture, it is male dominated, um, and perhaps the craft thing that the craft movement that's happening in both in the states and in Europe as well is maybe turning that around I think and just to maybe back that up about it became about the money for the big breweries rather than a mm. craft thing mm. um, if you're a member of the House of Lords in uh, Great Britain you're a member of the peerage um, so many brewers became members of the House of Lords partly because they gave so much money in dodgy political donations over the years that they actually became, began to be known as the beerage rather than the peerage. <laughs> because <laughs> you want to buy influence, that's how you do it. Um, anyone, anyone else? Any other questions? No? Uh, this obviously presentation is on the, uh, the, 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 the fileshare.net, I believe it's called. If I'm correct. Yep. Yep. And, um, so you can, yeah, and any... Wayne, sorry, one more thing. Um, yes. The bar spoons. Do you want to say something about them? No, what am I going to say? <laughs> They're yours. They're lovely. <laughs> you can keep them. Aren't they pretty? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but any other information, you, you, go, you know, my Twitter handle is uh, mixit um, underscore Wayne. And also our website is uh, mixit.co.uk. So any questions, any queries, you want to know any addresses, or if any of you visit London and say, I want to go to that place you told me about, on, I saw pictures of, where, do I, where is it? Happy to share that, all that information with you. So please stay in touch. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Mixit team here and also John Clay, uh, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the rest of the Thanks very much. Hard.